actually started yet. Uh, I'm just going to give a brief introduction. Uh, this is Warren Porter. He's going to be our seminar speaker today. Warren's at University of, uh, University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, he's a biophysical ecologist who's worked on uh, a number of, of animals from sea turtles to elephants, fiddler crabs to pikas, um, all sorts of other things too. Uh, so he's, he's in town for a few days. Uh, we're collaborating on a, on a project like on fiddler crabs and climate change. So, uh, oh yeah, this is a, his, his, his very impressive uh, <laughs> aluminum 3D printed fiddler crab model for use in a, in a wind tunnel for heat transfer coefficients. So. Uh, you can see that after, if you want, or maybe he'll hold it up again in the seminar. Uh, but anyway, th that's all I'm going to say about Warren. I'll let him uh, let him talk about a bit about what he does. So, well, thank you very much, Zach. And it's really a pleasure to be here. I appreciate all the hospitality we had. I had some wonderful brisket to, today for lunch, and uh, one of my favorites. Uh, I'm going to just kind of give you today a, a brief overview of how we set up these models and what they can do and how we go about uh, making some inroads and trying to understand how animals interact with uh, <clears throat> climate uh, at landscape scales um, and how we approach this from really kind of a mix of engineering and uh, 3D digital graphics and biology involving physiology, morphology, and behavior all of that put together and I'm going to illustrate that for you. Um, <clears throat> this work is a part of a large scale collaboration. Uh, in, in the case of the sea turtle, uh, we were, this Peter Dudley was one of my students. Um, Jeanette Winnikin, of course, down in Florida and she's the one who got us uh, young sea turtles to be able to test our model against. Uh, Ricardo Benz is an engineer, a, a, a mechanical engineer, physical uh, engineering physics person, um, and Todd Jones was crucial because he was the guy that developed the technology to grow these babies in the laboratory and be able to pro allow us to measure the physiology of the animals while they were swimming and photograph that and get at it. Um, Basically, the kind of thing we're doing is trying to understand form and function and things, all kinds of animals. In this case, some of the stuff we're working on now are, involves Triassic dinosaurs, and I'll show you a little bit of that toward the end of the talk. Um, and we're also designing dairy animals for the 21st century. We're asking how might we modify their morphology, especially to allow them to handle some of the increasing heat stress that they're going to be getting as the planet warms. Um, <clears throat> first, I'm going to just kind of give you an overview of, of the picture of, uh, uh, in this case, a, a desert lizard. Um, and I don't, I'm not working this oh, wrong button. There we go. Sitting on, on the substrate there, an analogous to what a fiddler crab would be doing if he was sitting on a beach um, <clears throat> and waving at uh, possibly female mates. Uh, we're able to take uh, an air temperature at a two meter height and wind speed at two meter height and we take some other measurements at other locations along this vertical profile here for both temperature and wind speed and develop equations that will describe those curves in general. We get the deep soil temperature which is the average mean temperature of the year for a, person, for a location. And so what we can do with our computer model is by putting all of these things together plus a general solar radiation model and sky thermal radiation model that's associated with that and this, we can reconstruct the local microenvironments on an hourly basis. And once we have that, we can start saying, okay, here's the microclimate. Now, if we know the animal properties, then we can compute how much food and how much water that animal needs, how long he's going to be able to be active, um, and we, so that we can get activity hours and we can also say where on the planet, where on the landscape this animal will, has to be in order to survive, to grow and to reproduce. We started out doing this a long time ago with desert lizards, a desert iguana here in Mojave. Developed a technology to cast this animal alive uh, without destroying it and get metal castings. That was what we did before we could do 3D printing with a virtual animal. Uh, <coughs> So that makes it a lot faster now. 
but we would, would have cheap detail on this casting that would tell us the scales and that kind of thing. So we put this in a wind tunnel and blow air over it and heat it up and let it cool. And from that, we could determine its heat transfer properties. Uh, after we got dry-skinned animals, we developed a model for wet-skinned animals, like this amphibian, this toad. Uh, and then we went to mammals and developed a fur model. And uh, as I'll show you in a minute, feather model. These are Iberian oryxes standing in the shade, and the temperature out here is about 125, 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, then we went to insects like the uh, uh, Aedes aegypti that carries dengue fever, and uh, working with Michael Kearney in Australia, developed a distribution model for these animals and their activity uh, periods and their potential for reproduction in modern and future climates. And if we had all this terrestrial stuff, I said, well, we've never done anything in the ocean. Let's do a leatherback sea turtle, because these are some of the most amazing, remarkable animals uh, in terms of their properties. And we'll talk about that more in just a minute. We also, by being able to reconstruct the uh, temperature profiles above and below ground, if you've got eggs sitting down here in a, in a burrow, we can determine how fast they're going to develop if we know their developmental rate as a function of temperature. And here's just another example of whooping cranes is that we've done recently with uh, Megan Fitzpatrick and uh, Paul Matthewson, who's been a key part of the development of these models also. And we'll show you some more of what he's done a little bit later. Um, <coughs> so, uh, first, I want to give you kind of an overview of how all of this fits together, uh, how we connect uh, various things. Oops, I pushed that a little too hard. <clears throat> uh, first, I want to just talk about how do we make connections between global climate change, local environments, animal design, and the physical, physiological, and behavioral properties of animals. And the answer to that is something I learned from the engineers. You start drawing pictures. Well, what kind of pictures do we talk about? <clears throat> we define a system diagram. This might be an imaginary surface around our animal. It might be a fiddler crab, it might be a frog, a mammal, whatever. And we know that there's going to be heat into that animal from the environment. We'll lose heat out to the environment. We'll generate heat because the animal is alive. And we may store heat by warming up or cooling off. And it's the picture and the boundary the system boundary, this imaginary system boundary that we draw that allows us to write the equation for the heat transfer, which is heat in plus heat generated equals heat out plus heat stored. And the same way for mass. Living systems have to take mass in. They oxidize some of that mass is a part of their heat generation. They will store mass if they're growing or reproducing uh, or getting fat, uh, and they will dump uh, excrete mass to the environment across again that same system boundary. And again, the picture and the arrows allow us to write the equation that mass in is equal to mass oxidized. Some of that is produces heat. And we have mass out and mass to the, uh, that can be stored. Um, <clears throat> this and each one of these terms has its own technical definition. And those definitions determine what kind of data we need to solve this equation for every moment through time. Here's a cross section of our hypothetical animal. This happens to be a, an insulated animal with fur. Um, this also can be used for feathers. But basically what we do is, here are our two equations. Heat, heat in plus heat generated equals heat out plus heat stored. <clears throat> and it's this heat generated term that's really crucial because we, what we say is, OK, if I, there's a core temperature I want to maintain here at the center of this animal, this could be a cross-section through an, uh, the torso of an animal, for example. Uh, it could be a cylinder, a sphere, an ellipsoid. And we want to know, if you want to maintain this core temperature, and you've got this environment out here, and you've got this insulation, and you've got this radial dimension, and maybe some fat underneath here, what does the metabolic rate have to be for each increment then we're going from here to here. What does this have to be to maintain that core temperature given the environmental conditions? And so we get that solution, that answer by guessing the solution. And um, <clears throat> um, it allows
allows us to compute uh, core skin temperature gradients. And that's important because as the core is the gradient between the core and the skin declines, and as this skin temperature approaches core temperature, you're not going to have any heat transfer because there's no temperature gradient. So at that point, you've got to do something, either physiological or behavioral. Uh, <clears throat> so our core skin gradient is a key thing for its behavior. It's going to be active or not. And the core temperature then determines what the metabolic rate has to be. And um, so that's where we start. We've got one more thing going on, too. And that is because this metabolic rate that we now know we have to have, that requires a certain amount of mass absorbed from the gut. This is the digestive system here, an imaginary entrance, an imaginary exit. <clears throat> we know what this has to be. If we know the digestive efficiency, that is, a, is it an herbivore or is it a carnivore, then we know how much mass has to go in on a daily basis to meet that need, to meet that need. And since this is a biological fire and requires mass, it also requires another kind of mass, oxygen. And so <clears throat> knowing what the kind of food is that's being absorbed, we can determine how much oxygen must be taken in by the respiratory system to meet that demand, and also how much CO2 will be produced for whatever diet the animal is on. Knowing what these, are, uh, these two fluxes are going to be determines what's going to happen when we've got air that we're pulling into the respiratory system, how much exchange is going to be, we're going to saturate that air with water vapor, and then we can compute how much is going to come out the other side. So we can do a mass balance on the respiratory system or the imaginary entrance and exit and on the gut. And if there are pesticides or pathogens in the, in the air or in the food or water, then we can determine daily dosages of toxic substances. So it becomes a very kind of generic way to approach a lot of environmentally related problems. Uh, if there is something that I should say, by the way, during this talk, and it's not clear, please raise your hand and I'd like to clarify it. I don't want to confuse you. Okay, so there is how we connect momentum, heat, and mass balances. Now how do we develop the model and have, what, what are some of the tests that we do to on um, terrestrial and marine environments and animals, and how do we take computational fluid dynamics uh, for swimming virtual weather backs and use that to explain uh, things that happen to them and might happen to them in the future. First, if we're going to do computational fluid dynamics, uh, I want to show you how we first demonstrated that we could predict the heat and mass transfer and the momentum balance on animals uh, like this scale model elephant here. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a rod that's screwed into the back of this thing. It's sitting on four ball bearings that are underneath the feet. And so the animal is basically floating on these roller bearings. And as the wind pushes on it from left to right, it pushes on this rod, which activates the uh, force balance device here. And we record that force balance, and I'll show you the results of that. Here's our wind tunnel. We can take this up to 200 miles an hour if we like. And uh, so we have a way of testing for the geometry of an elephant what its drag and what its heat transfer properties will be. And I'll illustrate that for you here. Here's our skin of our virtual elephant, our 3D elephant. Um, and we're going to here, we're first we're going to do the momentum balance. Here's a uh, 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 force. Uh, here, a negative force, a positive force, and the signs are reversed. But you can see when we blow air across this, the different degrees of force. Here's an, uh, the turbulent forces that come around here on the backside, and we get very uh, small numbers here. And uh, on the front here, we've got very high numbers. Um, <clears throat> major forces right on the center of the trunk and the forehead here. And when we integrate all of that and look at uh, drag forces, oops, sorry, wrong button. Look <clears> at <throat> drag forces. Uh, okay, here we go. Get the right buttons here. Heat transfer coefficient, this is in watts per meter square per degree Kelvin this way, and here's increasing airspeed here. And the way this was done was we'd heat up the casting with an intense uh, light source and get it real hot, and then measure how fast it's cooling 
And so here's the experimental result, uh, range of varied data, and here's the simulation right here, and then here, and then here. Now, these first two experiments were done with a single heating here, and so by the time we got to here, we didn't realize it, but the temperature was so low in the casting that our measurement error was not very good. By chance, we heated it up after this point, and here's our next point. And then finally, we didn't heat it again, and this it had cooled so much at these higher wind speeds that we had a, an error here. But we can correct for that one out now that we know what we're doing. Uh, <clears throat> so now we want to get at the heat transfer and mass transfer requirements of these turtles. So we're going to ask what are the properties of weatherbacks relevant to creating animated models at sea and on land. Uh, first, a little bit about their biology. Uh, once they, these little guys, here's the hatchling, here's the adult. This one here is about 2,000 pounds. They're about seven or eight feet long. They're massive animals. They can, uh, not, not only once they hit the water, they swim for the rest of their lives, but uh, they can dive to 1,200 meters. And uh, they can stay down for up to an hour. Amazing submersibles. Um, they can do 300, 3,000 mile migrations straight from Labrador where they feed down to islands where they lay their eggs here in the, uh, in the Atlantic. Um, their diet is exclusively jellyfish, and this is the inside of their mouth and their gut. Uh, jellyfish are about 9% protein and 91% water, and so this is a big processing problem uh, their gut goes all the way from their mouth way down to the bottom of their digestive cavity. Uh, I'm sorry, it comes back up here and then finally goes into their stomach. So they got a real long, long esophagus that processes this stuff. Since they can't chew, they've got to shred it with all of these um, wonderful apparatus here. Um, and then they're distributed in the ocean in temperatures that range from very cold waters when they're feeding and putting on fat like this one here is all fatted up and before they migrate down here and now you've got a very different kind of situation you're going from real cold like up in Wisconsin here down into the middle of the equator here where their islands are that they're going to lay their eggs at and that means the temperature is going to affect their energetics as adults and the rate of uh, incubation of their eggs how fast they're going to do that, and the distribution for each of their life stages, from these tiny hatchlings to these big adults. We'll see how that plays out in just a minute. And we need, again, to make connections, uh, again, from climate change through local environments, through animal design, and physiological and behavioral properties. And we're going to take it one step further from last time, where we were just looking at heat and mass, uh, and we got this equation here to adding momentum, which involves thrust and drag. So we've got to deal with that now in an aquatic environment. And so <clears throat> the things that we're going to be interested in now is a little bit more complicated equation, a heat balance equation, a mass balance equation, and now a force balance equation. So they're oxidizing mass, they're generating mechanical energy for thrust, and they're releasing heat. And now the question is, how do we solve all three of these things simultaneously? So first, let's point out some really interesting things about their body. When these guys are first hatched, they've got a flat belly. And if you look at them from the side, uh, this is what they look like. It looks like the wing on an airplane, doesn't it? Uh, and we're going to compare and contrast uh, spherical geometry with a ellipsoidal geometry. And when we do that, we got two kinds of drag. We got the pressure drag, which is right on the nose and the front surfaces of this ellipsoid or this sphere. And then we've got another kind of drag, which is called friction drag or shear. And so we've got to deal with both of these issues. Um, and that relates to our um, <coughs> uh, leatherback sea turtle because these little fat babies with flat bellies now after six months have a rounded belly and they're a really nice ellipsoid, which means that there's no difference in the friction or, or uh, uh, drag between the front or the top and the bottom. And like an airplane wing, when you've got greater velocity up on top relative to the bottom, you get a net 
pressure forces up, which is why airplanes fly. But if you turn this 90 degrees the way I had it from the front, now this upward pressure means airflow or fluid flow around the edges of the animal. And that has some implications for the shape of that uh, and what's going on with the surface of the animal. Because like uh, this six month old, when these guys are done feeding in Labrador and ready to migrate, look at the fat that's deposited in here. And by the time they get down to the equator, look at the channels that are in that back where the fat has been depleted. They lost this heavy insulation that was so great for the cold water, and now, they, now they're set a whole lot better for uh, dealing with heat loss down in the tropics. The only trouble is, now they've got a lot more surface area because you've got all these ridges all the way across the animal. And uh, there are even some on its belly. And so you might wonder, are these deep back channels creating more surface area and more drag? Is that a significant issue for these animals? Uh, and uh, so that led us to then begin then to create a virtual 3D image uh, in this case, from a casting of a, of a dead leatherback. Um, but we can take photos um, or drag calculations, and as you just saw, now with new technologies, we can, from a 3D image, create a virtual animal and put it in a wind tunnel. And uh, so what we're going to do here is put this in a virtual wind tunnel. And the first thing we're going to do is, since we want this thing to be swimming, we have to put a skeleton on it. And so we insert a skeleton that uh, it has a whole series of articulated joints, and as you'll see in some movies I'm going to show you shortly, uh, we can animate this thing so that it mimics the actual swimming motion of a leatherback sea turtle. Oh, and by the way, once we get them into the computer with this imagery, we can use it to print them out, as you, of course, know. And we can simply set the scale differently to get a little one or a bigger one. We can do a uh, shell only just to look at what the shell properties are uh, when the shell is fat, uh, has a lot of fat or, or none at all or very little. So <clears throat> we take our virtual casting uh, in collaboration with Ricardo Baeza, who's the guy that owns that window I showed you, and he is our uh, engineering physicist. Uh, he typically works on Mac-10 uh, shock tubes and supersonic aircraft, but he's also really keen on working with us on these turtles, and so it's really fun to have a, a fabulous uh, collaborator like that. And so here's a top view of our virtual wind tunnel. The flow is going to come in here, pass them on this imaginary web, spider web of 3D uh, threads and it keeps track of where the water goes, especially over the animal, and then comes out the back end. And this allows us to compute both the momentum and the heat energy uh, for leatherback sea turtles, as I'll show you in just a little bit. Um, here's what that uh, casting of the animal looks like when it's been meshed. Uh, this is a slice right down the center of the middle of the animal. And here's the webbing uh, that uh, is just a single web uh, among, I'm not showing you all the other web that's around it, and here's the webbing that the program puts on the animal so we can keep track of what the fluid flow is for every little part of the animal. When we run that fluid flow simulation, we're interested in two parts of the animal. One is the front for the aesthetic pressure contours, that is the uh, forward, the, the main pressure areas, what's the resistance to flow, and you see the highest amounts of pressure are located on the leading edges of the wings and these axillary areas and on the front of the animal, and then much lower pressure forces on the side of the animal. Um, and then that's one part of the pressure, that is the frontal pressure, but now we want to look at the shear forces, the, the, on the, the, the drag forces, on the rest of the surface of the animal. And as you see, they're really pretty low. Um, uh, and what that tells us is something really important, because the pressure drag that's on the front of the animal is almost 10 times greater than the friction drag. So the friction drag is associated with all this area. And so you can put ridges here or take them away, and it's not going to make much difference because of the nature of the difference between these two kinds of drag. 
And so this was very exciting because all of a sudden it began to realize that when those bridges are there, it prevents that um, water from flowing up over the animal from both sides because it's still a, a basically an aerodynamic wing here, the whole body is. And controlling that flow around the size of the animal means you're improving the drag performance by more than 30% because these uh, side things are good for about 30% of the total drag on the animal. And controlling that, keeping that from happening is really important. Now, <clears throat> one more thing we need to deal with is how do we figure out what the requisite water temperature is for different sizes of animals. Now we said that <clears throat> we could compare a sphere and an ellipsoid. Actually, a sphere is a special case of an ellipsoid where the, all the dimensions are the same in every direction. And it hadn't, we hadn't, didn't have a, an equation for heat transfer and heat generation in an ellipsoid, but uh, about quite a few years ago now, uh, uh, we managed to break through that. Uh, we know that the core skin gradient for a sphere is this equation right here, the heat generation per unit volume times the radius squared divided by six times the thermal conductivity of the tissue. This is an equation that will describe the heat transfer and the core skin gradient for any sphere. Now, it turns out that an ellipsoid equation is the same kind of form. It's T core minus T skin is equal to the heat generation per unit volume times this thing called S squared. It's a geometry type term all over 2K. And now the question is, is this really good? And we, we can determine whether or not this is an accurate equation for ellipsoid by converting the radial dimension here to 1. And if we, and this S squared here is defined here as the three axes, A, B, and C, squared here, and then here are the terms in the nu numerator. If you make all of these have a value of 1, this becomes the fraction of 1 third. And if you stick a 1 third up here, uh, this turns into this equation right here. So we know it's an accurate uh, representation of the heat transfer in ellipsoid with heat generation internally. Where this thing here, this Q triple prime, is the total heat generation divided by the volume. And so, <clears throat> in the water, it's very simple. The heat generated is going to be the heat lost, and that's going to be the heat lost by convection. And this mechanism equation is just simply the heat transfer coefficient times the surface area times the difference between the skin and the water temperature. Now it's possible putting all of these equations together here to get this equation into a form that we have at the very bottom here where we can solve for water temperature. And that's the core temperature minus the total heat generation times this term here, which is the geometry, the volume, the thermal conductivity of the tissue, the heat transfer coefficient to the uh, heat transfer coefficient to the water, and the air, area surface of the animal. All easily measurable. So this is what we need to figure out what water temperatures animals of different sizes can swim in. And <clears throat> we get the heat generation term from our computational fluid dynamics. We get the surface heat transfer coefficient from the computational fluid dynamics or <coughs> from experiment. And the area can also be determined by our 3D animal. So we're in great shape now to figure out what are those water temperatures. Now let's, now we ask for different sizes of animals, from little hatchlings all the way up to the big monsters. What is the resting metabolic rate of an animal to be able to uh, get that core skin gradient? We set the core to be about 37 degrees, and ask now what does the skin temperature have to be? So let's start simple. For a 100 kilogram animal, mass here, if it's resting, it's just the resting metabolism right here will maintain a three degree core skin gradient. If it's two times resting metabolism, it's going to have a six degree gradient. If we go to something bigger, like 500 kilograms here, resting is going to be about a six degree gradient. Swimming twice resting, it's going to need a 12 degree gradient between core and skin. And we go to a really big one, 900 kilos. We're looking at a 9 degree <coughs> gradient 
versus 18 year ingredient. Now, <clears throat> if you're running at about a 37 degree core temperature, you, your absolute upper limit would be something here around 36 degrees water uh, below your core temperature, which is almost zero degrees C. This would be one degrees centigrade water temperature. So this is our gradient. So anything above that is out of bounds. In other words, the metabolic rate allowable requires that bigger animals are going to have to be staying out of this area. They've got to be down here, and they've got to be going fairly slowly. Little tiny guys can have huge metabolic rates, four times resting, no problem. So we begin to understand that this whole metabolism water temperature thing is a very nonlinear phenomenon. Now we can compare what we can compute with what's actually been measured. And in the field, uh, James Morosky, for example, in northern foraging waters saw temperature gradients between corn and skin here of on the order of up to 11 degrees and average close to 8. Down in equatorial nesting waters where they've got to be swimming, that gradient is more like 2 to 3 degrees. Big differences. <coughs> well, we begin, we, had our, we have our steady state things, but now we'd like to know, can we make our, our uh, leatherback sea turtle do something that absolutely um, involves um, well, let's see, this thing here, uh, maybe that should be coming up here, but uh, that lighter, let me take this off here for a minute. Uh, let's try hiding it and see if we can make it come up. There we go. So, Chad Smith over in the art department, who is a grad student of Steve Hilliard over here, uh, and I got together, I took a couple of uh, Steve's courses in designing 3D animals, and um, <clears throat> it turns out that one of the really big challenges here was the movement of those flippers, because this surface here was made initially of a set of networks, like you put a fishnet over the whole animal, and then you cover it with a saran wrap. And, but this, in this case, it was a metabolic, or, sorry, a mathematical wrap to keep these things from ripping when, this, when the flippers move. So once we had a technology where we could actually move the fins without rupturing the surface, then we were in a position to get really exciting because uh, we could, firstly, we realized now we could model the original time traveler from 170 million years ago because that's how long these guys have been around. And <clears throat> so we had a, now our computational fluid dynamics turtle, and this is the turbulent kinetic energy coming off the backside of the flippers as the animal is simulated to be swimming. And now we're going to be looking at the pressure gradient across these things. Uh, red is high pressure and blue is a low negative pressure. And you can see as the flippers move, and these are simulations based on the actual um, movement of turtle flippers, of leatherback turtle flippers and movies that we took of them. <clears throat> and now we're going to get into the heat flux from the flippers too. Here's the heat loss. Red is the highest heat loss and 3100 is the lowest heat loss. And you can see how dynamic here's some heat coming off of here from the flippers uh, showing up. So this was really exciting. Now the question is how real is this? And that led us to this key piece of work. This was done in collaboration with all those people that were on that first slide. And <clears throat> we have the actual data uh, in terms of the force histograms that we got from swimming leatherback sea turtles, the average of the data are right here, and what we got from our simulation was right here. So we were within a reasonable amount of error for the leatherback sea turtles swimming using the kind of motion on the fins that was replicant of what we actually observed when we had a baby uh, or had neonates 
in a sealed metabolic chamber we were measuring oxygen consumption we had them on a tether so we could measure the force they were generating and uh, we were also uh, photographing them with uh, movie cameras at very high rates from two dimensions and we were able to get 3d uh, simulations and again this was thanks to Jeanette Winnikin <coughs> her neonate leatherbacks in that respirometer this was really really exciting uh, because now we could believe some of these calculations. We could look at uh, data from the literature on body temperature in different water, uh, at water, different water temperatures and different swim speeds. And here was the water temperature here. Here was the body temperature. This is the worst agreement. Um, and these are, these shaded areas are different parts of the body because we had a web inside the animal as well as outside the animal so we could look at how much uh, the body was at a given temperature. And here is at 25, here's the body temperature, water temperature, body temperature, water temperature, body temperature, water temperature, at different uh, temperatures here. So we got very good agreement uh, between measured values in animals and our calculated values. Uh, that gave us some confidence that maybe we could look at uh, what is going to be the core temperature of, leather, of the average size leatherback sea turtle? Uh, what, here's the core temperature code here. Here is what we have right now in the way of body core temperatures in the Indian, in the uh, Western Pacific here. We've got some areas that are kind of getting up way near the top, uh, but not too much. By 2100 with moderate CO2, here are the things that are happening. And this is what we expect we're going to see if we don't do something about the CO2 in our environment. Uh, we're actually headed in a direction where the CO2 will be even higher than this estimate. But if this should happen, you can see the massive consequences of uh, exclusion of these animals from a whole region, whole regions of the ocean, massive regions. So just in terms of the adult, the average size adult that we have today, this is the kind of projection we have for leatherbacks. We also need to deal with leatherbacks when they come out on land because they've got to lay eggs. And <clears throat> we can simulate what the core temperature is going to be, in this case, in Africa. <coughs> Africa. Uh, here's Gabon, Africa in 2010 with the climate there. This first little bit here is crawling. Here's digging. Here's laying. This is what the body temperature is doing. When they're covering up the eggs, the temperature's going up here. Here they're returning to the water and then they're swimming away. In 2100, their core temperature is going to be up here. And this is going to be the track. And they're going to be getting up close to 36 degrees by the time they have to return to the water. So all of a sudden, the act of laying eggs and coming out on the land is going to be a massive energy and water requirement for these animals. This is why they lay them at night right now, so they don't overheat. You don't see them up in the daytime laying eggs. And if you look at three different places, uh, <clears throat> um, West Papua New Guinea, uh, 172 centimeter long animal versus 125 centimeter body size differences. Here are the differences in off of West Papua New Guinea coming up on the beach. Uh, uh, not so bad in French Guiana, where we've got these two, they're pretty close, and then Gabon here was the most conservative of all in terms of impacts. And so these effects on leatherbacks are going to be site specific. But the exciting thing about this is that knowing the, uh, the, the current estimates of how the climate's going to change in these different egg laying areas, we can say which ones are going to be impacted the most and where we've got the best chance of. Uh, uh, pulling them out of this. And then once they lay the eggs, we've got to ask what's their probability of actually making it out of the ground. <coughs> uh, <coughs> Peter Dudley uh, got the data from the literature on the temperature down in the sand compared to the success of hatching and the probability of that happening. And we got this S-shaped curve here. Uh, which is a representation of the likelihood function of hatching success as a function of temperature. And 
What that says is when we look at modern conditions, which are over here on the left column, and look at what are the percent of successful hatches of the nests in New Guinea, French Guiana, and Gabon, we're looking at 46%, 47%, 45%, 43% hatching success modern day. This is from modern data. By 2100, with high CO2, we're looking at 7%. 17% and 9% hatching success. Uh, obviously, that means quite substantial change and effect on the population of these leatherback sea turtles. Now I want to just take you uh, briefly for a, a short uh, survey of some of the things we're doing uh, to get at <coughs> the Triassic environment and a couple of key types of dinosaurs that uh, lived back in the Triassic. Uh, this is a work uh, we're doing with David Lovelace in geology, his student Scott Hartman, and then Linsmeyer, and also in geology, and Paul, who's here in the room with me, and myself. We had two things to deal with, the climate. Here is the ancient, the Triassic landmass, and these squares here are areas of, that are now part of the United States and for December and through February and June through August. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, here's the precipitation mass for that same uh, circumstance. And as it turns out, um, we're able to decode based on the types of uh, substrates, whether you've got dolichretes or gypcretes or calcretes or vertisols or fusinites, all of these things tell us different things about what was the rainfall pattern from very low precipitation to um, uh, moderately uh, moderate uh, precipitation, basically a semi-arid region. This would be semi-humid if we had it or humid. And because of the kinds of sediments we find here, the types of uh, chem chemicals in the soil and some other data on we can reconstruct what the rainfall was. And that is very useful uh, for lots of reasons. <clears throat> what we're able to do then is reconstruct roughly what the cloud cover range was from minimum to maximum throughout the year from January to December, the relative humidity range, wind speed ranges. Here's the temperature range that we would expect seasonally from January through December based upon these stable, stable isotopes in the soil. And to be uh, sure that we covered the ground, we created a, temp a high temperature estimate and a low temperature estimate. And then we ran simulations with these environmental conditions on two different kinds of dinosaurs. A uh, 850 kilogram stegosaurus type animal um, uh, lateral view here. Uh, these guys, uh, we approximated them. We were able to approximate them as cones and cylinders and dimensional cylinders and legs and tail. Uh, that turns out, turns out we were able to get really very close to uh, approximations based on what we knew about the elephants that I showed you earlier. And uh, the other one, uh, the first one was a plant-eating animal. This is uh, um, our carnivore coelophysis. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, animals that were so uh, well featured in Jurassic Park, uh, several of those movies. The interesting thing about their geometry is not the side view, but rather the top view. Look at how narrow they are. We're looking at them from the front or the, or the front or the back. That tells us the, this asymmetry says, man, there's a tremendous amount of heat that can be transferred laterally here because the tissue is so thin relative to the length. So this is where the heat transfer is going to come. And something like this could be generating a lot of heat and dissipated very easily just because of its geometry. Very exciting to see that. And so we began to put together what are the limiting situations? What if these guys had a marsupial metabolism or a reptile metabolism? Uh, and what if they were naked or they had fur on top? We have data from the literature showing this. Or a totally furry body. If they were reptile metabolism, this is the temperature range in which they can operate right here. 
even though the furry body is a little broader, but not much. But look what's happens when we turn it into a marsupial metabolism. We've got this, we've got this, we've got this. We can go more than doubles the, the range of temperatures that they can tolerate. And there's evidence in the fossil literature for feathers on these kinds of guys, and especially in the northern areas. Um, and here we go with the two side by side, comparing their energy requirements. Now, <clears throat> one of the neat things we can do with the model is also say, okay, given the current metabolic rates of animals, what would be the range of metabolism uh, high and low, which are these two dotted lines here. This, is, this would be the normal thermal neutral range where they'd be most comfortable. And if they were furry on top, the best situation for them would be the hot environments. This, they'd, they'd be able to handle the typical one that we expected. And they'd also be able to handle the very cold environment, which is up here, with no problem. Not so for Platysaurus, the big guy, but it was herbivorous. This was the normal temperature range we would expect based on their mass and a, and, and a typical uh, uh, marsupial-type metabolism. So that means that the cold and the medium temperatures would be OK, but the hot temperatures, man, there's no way they could be able to handle that. They're way below their, their, their minimum possible. So these guys are going to have to be up north in northern, the higher latitudes, both north and south. And when you look at the possible distributions, that's exactly where they are. They're all up high uh, in the high latitudes. There's no evidence of them. And there's a lot of sedimentary data where these guys are all over the map. And they're everywhere. Velociraptors. So <clears throat> what, this is kind of a summary of some of the things we can look at. We can look at activity hours, uh, water available, and daily food. All three of these come out of these models. Here is the naked animal, the naked velociraptor, uh, 24 hours of activity in the cold, but some constraints in the heat. As you get to furry tops, this thing drops a little lower. Fully furry body, there's just no way they're going to handle that very well. And this gigantic animal here, it really would like the cool environments, not the hot ones. Here's the water availability, and you see how that shrinks. Here's the daily food requirements, and you see how that drops, and how this is really all over the map, depending on whether it's cold or hot. So these are just a few of the things that we found uh, from this simulation. The manuscript is in revision. We're just about ready to resubmit it. And it looks like that's going to be published, hopefully, this uh, spring sometime. I just wanted to show you a little bit about the program resources we have, the photo methods for geometries, and how we're applying this to dairy animals very briefly. Here's nichemapper.com. If you go there, you've got dairy niche mapper where you can do cattle. And uh, we're, working, we're putting in water buffalo now and a bunch of other uh, milk producing ones. This will get you the properties of air, seawater, and fresh water that you need for the models. This will give you climate information anywhere on the planet. And here are some of the species that we can do uh, with this model. Here's how we do um, on geometries. Uh, polar bear stuff, uh, Paul, Math Paul Matthewson was the key guy on doing this. And what you see is that we need the width of the head, the height of the head, the length of the head, the neck, vertical and horizontal uh, lengthwise dimension, and uh, the total height of the animal, and the dimensions here. And we even get remarkably good uh, results doing this kind of thing. It was surprising. But we always want to be as accurate as we can, and so that's why we go to these castings, too, to make sure that what we're doing is not just some pie-in-the-sky imaginary kind of thing that has no relevance to reality. And here's our virtual cow. And uh, with our 3D modeling, we can change the proportions of these animals. We could change the width or the height or the length of the legs. We do all kinds of things on the computer and ask if we were able to engineer these things geometrically, what would that do to their ability to produce milk under high heat stress conditions? So in summary, we can just kind of say, what's the importance of creating such models? 
Well, we can get mechanistic explanations for species distribution shifts with climate change, as Paul has shown with pikas and other animals. Uh, we can provide insights from multiple levels of future impacts of climate change. Uh, applications in agriculture, the, getting at potential productivity and metabolic expenditures of farm animals in different regions. Uh, this program runs now on a cell phone, a smartphone, and we can use trait-based models which can be used for evolutionary selection, and we're doing some stuff now that is really, really exciting because we're beginning to understand what are the designs that give you the kinds of things that work in your local environment. I haven't published that yet, and I haven't shown it to you because this thing is going to be out there, but uh, this is something we're working on, and it's really going to crack open some stuff that um, people have been trying to understand for a very long time. So I want to say thank you very much for your attention, and I'm welcoming questions. Yes? Um, so given what you've learned about the heat diffusion of the body shapes, uh, given the climate projection models, what adaptations do you think that leatherback turtles would benefit most from, like a single one, um, given their climate model? Like increased surface area for heat diffusion or a different body morph, like compression on certain ends? Definitely different body morphs. Smaller turtles are going to do better. And um, and if you can collapse one dimension, you've got an avenue for dumping heat. It's also a double-edged sword because it can also mean that you can get heat faster. And so the temperatures that you're in are, are still going to constrain you. And then the other thing is that the eggs have got to have a temperature regime in the soil that is appropriate in terms of length and and temperature so while you can you might be able to redesign the adults or even the young you've got to also make sure that, that, that you've got environments where those eggs will hatch yes i'm interested in you mentioned some of your modeling for the adults but for the hatchlings and that's one of the most susceptible times for turtles and you mentioned the difference in the shell how it's flatter on the bottom for the hatchlings did you model that difference throughout to see is that having The only advantage, yeah, I think if the hatchling could come out with a, with a rounded belly, it would. Mm -hmm. But the, the amount that you, unless you change the size of the egg, uh, you're, you're really gonna, you're really kind of constrained to having a lean baby and then trying to put on as much as you can, as fast as you can once you're out of that egg and you can get access to resources and get your gut working. More, more on leatherbacks. Uh, so there's a couple of traits that I wonder about, one of which is the navigation trait of leatherbacks, that they can locate themselves in currents. And I'm wondering if that ability to locate yourself in a current reduces your energetic need to the degree that it might affect uh, your model. Oh, uh, definitely. The animals have shown over and over again their tendency to want to try to use currents if they possibly can, and they often will. Uh, the tracking data show that very clearly, especially when they're young. Uh, when, they, when they're when they hatched off of the east coast of the U.S., for example, they head out to sea, they pick up the Gulf Current, <coughs> and they just stay right in that current, takes them over toward the Canary Islands, and so for quite a long time they're circling around in the mid-Atlantic area, at least on all the east coast, the ones that hatch there. That so must give them some cumulative benefit over time. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and, and they uh, they will often, at least some of the other kinds of turtles, uh, like the sea turtle, the green sea turtle, will get into sphagnum. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the masses of seaweed, and, and that turns out, in a paper we, we did with uh, Jeanette, it, it turns out to be a little microclimate in the ocean, because sun kind of coming down warms up this mass of seaweed, it's also a place where there's a lot of uh, uh, planktonic uh, stuff right in the seaweed. And so they've got this little warm island that they're floating on, and they've got lots of food there, and they've got also some visual protection from predators. Uh, and, and so it turns out that a lot of these young sea turtles, I don't think so much for the leatherbacks because they're always swimming, but uh, they will, if they bump into something in their, in their Food preserve, uh, somewhat impeded, they will tend to relax and stop a little bit at least. 
So I think there are a lot of things going on here, behaviorally and physiologically. Um, and and they're, they're, they're plenty smart. I mean, they've had 170 million years to figure out how to do this, and they're really good at it. So, so the other trait I wanted to just briefly mention is the countercurrent exchange in, in the flipper, which I think there was a recent paper that suggested that it is to conserve heat in the flipper and not in the core. And I'm wondering if you thought about that as a contribution for 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 uh, heat exchange and that we actually modeled the countercurrent heat exchanger at the base of, of of each of the flipper arms. I didn't I didn't mention that in the in the simulations there, but um, you can you can or cannot use that flipper as a heat dissipation device depending on what that temperature is. You can, but you always have to have some blow up blood flow out there because you've got to keep the, that tissue alive. But uh, there is a there's a variation so that such that you can change the effect of thermal conductivity from about 0.4 watts per square per meter per second to about 2.8 watts per meter uh, per second. So there's a factor of, a, of about seven times increase in heat dissipation from the flipper if you want to use it based on, on what we know so far about their physiology and the tissue properties. Yes? Does the model, uh, is it actually uh, tapping into the metabolic rate, you know, the, the metabolic response to temperature? Or as the, I, it seems like there's this counteracting process going on where if the organism is within a higher temperature ambient environment, then also, its metabolic rate could be elevated due to, to, to the elevated temperature, and that would actually um, decrease the gradient potential between the core and the, and the skin. That's, that's, that's true, it could, and this is why the animals have to slow down their, their uh, production of mechanical energy, because they just simply can't afford to do that uh, high velocity, high speed, high beat frequency in warm waters. Uh, they just don't do that. They, they swim very slowly, and the reason that they have to do that is is, is that they could cook themselves with their own metabolic heat if they're not careful, especially the big ones, because you've got, uh, especially if they're, they've got a lot of fat on them. When you mentioned, you know, when you showed the, the, the maps of the climate change and, and how that certain areas would exclude the, the, the adult leather back, what would be sort of a threshold temperature that would sort of be prohibited for the adult size? Uh, well, the adult size probably somewhere around 35, 36, 37 degrees, somewhere in that range. Um, unless there's some kind of an adaptation that allows them to go to temperatures like the uh, uh, fiddler crabs where they can get up to about 43. But if you're over 43, I don't know, even that desert iguana won't handle much more than that. It, it will do 47 at the moment, but uh, that's the upper limit. Thank you. Yes? Ian specified that I'm assuming you took into account like skin color, and mm -hmm. have you tried to see how much a small change in skin color may affect the overall performance? What it, does it make a difference? Uh, the question much? was for, for skin color. Um, Skin color in the water just does it does not make much difference at all because the water the, the water is so good. But on land, it it will make a difference, and uh, you can it, depending on the size of the animal, the wind speed, the humidity, uh, and whether or not there is sun, uh, you can really heat that animal up and cause it to die. Um, it's probably why the animals always come out at night, uh, usually about two o'clock in the morning or sooner. Uh, they have a, an incredible sense of smell. Um, I, I remember when I was down in uh, uh, Florida uh, about three, well, four or five years ago when we were uh, doing the work on, on the leatherbacks, um, we were on the beach. It was total darkness. There was no lights from the city or anything, um, but there was a, just a little bit of moonlight, and we could see that, that one of the big females had come out. She was starting to come out of the water. She was downwind from us, like about 100 yards, and she came a little bit out of the water, and then all of a sudden she raised her head, and then she looked at us, and then she turned around and went back in the ocean. 
Um, I think that they've got some really incredible senses of smell, partly because if they're feeding on jellyfish, that's going to be real hard to see. They've got they've got slime, they've got things that, that would be uh, something that an olfactory system could pick up. And I, I think that maybe one of the main ways that they find food is uh, actually to sniff it out. They've got lots of really incredible capacity. Uh, they, they, have, they have star field navigation. They can navigate by the stars. And there's some evidence that maybe they might also have bird uh, magnetic migration capabilities. Well, it's, it's just an amazing system to work with. And so, it's so impressive. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed all your questions. It's great questions. Thank you. Thank you. 